I did write a paper for this book, which I recommend to you, called The Philosophy of Pseudoscience. Philosophers can fill books uh, very, very easily, uh, so it takes a whole book to say what pseudoscience is. Even then, it doesn't do the job. So I'm not going to tell you what it is. Uh, what I thought I'd do is say something about why pseudoscience isn't the same thing as bad science, science fraud, or non-science, uh, argue that it's a useful and important concept that we need to use and uh, articulate, think about, deploy, um, compare it to another concept, the concept of bullshit, and um, then say some, maybe, depending on how much time I've got, which probably, I mean, it's already 10 past 12, uh, say something more about uh, how we could distinguish between conceptions of science and pseudoscience that focus on the product and conceptions that focus on the producer, and a few other remarks. And then I think say something at the end about why pseudoscience is so attractive, um, diagnose it. And also, um, yeah, well, OK. So Harry Frankfurt said in 1986, and, and you tell me, is it more or less true now? One of the most salient features of our culture is that there's so much bullshit. And um, in, there was a lot less bullshit. In those days, probably, that was the only time... You know, there was bullshit in, in his essay on bullshit in universities, but there's so much bullshit in universities now, uh, and it's creeping into science as well. So I think I want to, I want to um, preface my remarks by saying that um, you know, uncritical... Uh, bowing down before anything that's called science or anything that's regarded as legitimate authority uh, in epistemic matters is not a good idea. And uh, you, there, there, there are more and more dubious things about the way that science is being done um, in universities in our, in our culture. So one should be very careful about setting up, you know, angels and demons and, and regarding the, you know, the scientific establishment as beyond fault and then contrasting pseudoscience with it. Uh, um, and I'll say some more about that later. However, in broad brush, uh, science is our best source of knowledge about the world. It's reliable form of inquiry. It's delivered immense benefits to human beings. Pseudoscience is to be contrasted with it. Um, and I'm not a science skeptic. I mean, I spend most of my life trying to learn about science. And so um, I'm trying to contribute to the goal of defending science against bullshit by uh, saying something about what makes pseudoscience pseudoscience. OK, so the first thing I, I wanted to say was that science is not, uh, pseudoscience is not just bad science. And it's not just non-science. It's not just science fraud. So, um, let, let me start with that. Um, if you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, it tells you that pseudo means something like sham, pretended, put forward falsely, and so on. Now, um, obviously, non-science, you know, despite the fact that some people would say, you know, call themselves scientistic, in the sense would say something like all knowledge comes from science, and so on, um, I don't think that's correct. There's lots of forms of activity, intellectual activity, that are not scientific, but are perfectly intellectually respectable, that do deliver knowledge, and so on. So I don't think you have to regard history as scientific, but it delivers knowledge, it's empirically based, and so on. So we don't want to say that non-science is bad, and pseudoscience is a pejorative term, and so non-science, pseudoscience, different things to start with. Okay. Now, that's fairly easy to, to say, but many philosophers of science have thought that we don't really need the concept of pseudoscience, we just need the concept of bad science. And so Chris was uh, mentioning this, you know, that, that some people say, look, you know, when presented with pseudoscience, we should just get all the evidence together and show that what, what's being put forward is bad science. We don't need to have a separate concept of pseudoscience. And I think... Uh, we want to argue that that's not sufficient, that we do need a separate concept of pseudoscience the pseudo, for some of the reasons that he was arguing, that pseudoscience has certain characteristics. Uh, there's a kind there that we're picking out in the world when we talk about it. It's not just reducible to bad science. So, for example, I mean, just to you know, establish this fact by argument, then consider a 
very poor undergraduate physicist in the lab. What they produce, their experimental results, are bad science. There's nothing sham or pretended or deceptive about what they're doing. They're just not very good at it. Uh, there's lots of cases from the history of science of people purporting to make discoveries, and then it's shown later that they used bad methods, that their statistical inferences were shoddy, that uh, there were one or, or other problems with what they were doing. And it, it's not, you know, in many of those cases, the people involved were perfectly honest, perfect, displayed the virtues of scientists, they just got it wrong. So bad science, again, is not pseudoscience. Pseudoscience is not bad science. Now, of course, they may overlap, but we need a, we need a separate concept of pseudoscience to the concept of bad science. So what about science fraud? Well, science fraud does have that feature that the Oxford English Dictionary is, says is associated with pseudoscience, which is that it's a sham, it's false, it's pretended. However, I, uh, I don't think that uh, the concept of pseudoscience reduces to the concept of, pseudo of, of science fraud for several reasons. And one, one is that science fraud um, it obviously involves deliberate deception. But pseudoscience needn't, actually. So pretended, I mean, as we all, all know to our cost, we can pretend things to ourselves without realizing, can't we? We can, we can deceive ourselves about what we're doing. And um, Chris was talking about uh, Freud and Adler and so on, Karl Popper's famous critique of their psychology. Now, don't think that even Popper um, who's a, a, a very unforgiving character, a thought that they were dishonest in any way. You know, Freud devoted his life to trying to understand the human mind. Uh, he was obsessed by the, the goal of understanding the human mind. There was nothing fraudulent or dishonest about his uh, supposed pseudoscience. So, and, and likewise, you know, I think... Many people who believe in homeopathy and who... And I don't think we have to think that the, the people out there who, who take people into their clinics and treat them with homeopathy are fraudsters, are, are like people selling, um, you know, uh, timeshare to old-age pensioners or something, right? You know, many of them are sincere. I mean, they're just mistaken about what they're, about what they're doing. And this, you know... I. I I quoted Frankfurt, so now let me just make contact with his concept of bullshit. Frankfurt says that um, bullshit is not like lying. And the reason it's not is because the liar cares a great deal about the truth. They just don't want you to believe it. Or in particular, they don't want you to believe what they think the truth is. Because, of course, you can... You can say something true and still be lying, right? Um, if, you, if you believe it to be false. So lying, roughly speaking, we can define to be uh, deliberately trying to bring about in someone else a belief that you believe to be false, right? And uh, pseudoscience needn't involve that. Right? As, as with bullshit, it's sort of more remote from the truth than lying. In a way, that's what makes it so pernicious. Lying is relatively straightforward to catch out, right? The liar makes factual claims that can be checked. The science fraudster can be caught out. But, pseudo, but, but bullshit and pseudoscience have in common that the, what's produced can be so difficult to pin down, so vague and so all over the place, that in fact, it's very, very difficult to say it's false. So, two reasons then to think that um, pseudoscience isn't just science fraud. I mean, one, that fraudsters are deliberately deceiving and pseudoscientists needn't be. Another, that the products are distinct. Um, the, the, the products of science fraud, fra science fraud are pretty much continuous with the products of ordinary science, right? Uh, and another reason to think it is that um, the, the, the pseudoscience is sort of more fundamentally flawed than science fraud. The problem with science fraud isn't the 
whole basis of the methodology and, and so on. It's just that that methodology hasn't been applied properly. And indeed, I mean, you know, some cases of science fraud may involve the, the, the publication of results that are actually true, right? You might just know that another lab down the road is going to publish them and you haven't quite finished your data analysis or gathering your data, so you stick yours out and pretend that you've done stuff that you haven't, right? And so you produce what is actually a true, you know, a true hypothesis and you produce the data that's supposed to support it, but as a matter of fact, it's still fraud because you didn't really gather the data, you just invented it to get, you know, to get the hypothesis out, to get the result out. Okay, so that's my first uh, objective sketched, right? Um, I won't claim to have argued fully for it, but I want to say pseudoscience is not reducible to non-science or to bad science or to science fraud. The fakery of, um, and, and on the, the strongest, um, the, the closest connection is with fraud, but I want to say the fakery of pseudoscience is more profound than the mere fakery of results. Um, science fraud may involve fabricating data to support a true theory. Science fraud and pseudoscience may overlap, but nonetheless, they're really different things. Now, um, I'll give you another quote, which is a quote from the philosopher of science, Imre Lakatosh. And I started by saying I wanted to show that pseudoscience wasn't science fraud, wasn't false science, wasn't non-science, and my second objective is to say that we need the concept. And Lakatosh is of this view. He says, the demarcation between science and pseudoscience is not merely a problem of armchair philosophy. It's of vital social and political relevance. And why is that? Well, despite the fact that routinely in our culture we seem to suppose that everybody is in a position to think about everything and give their opinion on it. As a matter of fact, even within science, deferring to epistemic, I mean, by which I mean um, pertaining to knowledge, right? deferring to authorities in respect of, of, the, of the relevant knowledge is absolutely essential. Right? It's not just essential for lay people who don't know anything about science at all, who must go to the doctor and believe what the doctor says about what drugs work, right? But it's also essential for scientists. If you uh, were involved in discovering the Higgs boson, very, very unlikely that you will understand all the scientific ingredients that went into that, that discovery. That's why there's like 150 people on, on, uh, named as authors on, on papers in particle physics. Because there's a whole team that understand how one particular detector works. And there's another team that understands how to write the computer code. And there's another team that understands how to, un to pull the garbage out of the, um, to pull the noise out of, this, uh, out of the data using statistical methods. And there's another team that understands the theory. Right? And there's another team that understands how to liaise between the theorists and the experimenters and so on, right? So to the extent that um, some um, papers are actually produced after the authorship committee has decided who should be named on the paper, right, literally. They have to have a committee to decide whose name goes on the paper. And that's, even if you're you know, a scientist, you still have to defer to your colleagues who have the relevant expertise. Science is so specialised and requires so much background knowledge and that's obviously even more true for the lay person who has very little scientific training. So despite the fact that we're inclined to say, you know, do you think there's glo anthropogenic global warming? Call us now. Uh, you know, we really, most of us, just aren't entitled to have opinions about that. I mean, the only rational thing for us to do is get our opinions from someone else, insofar as we're going to have them. Right? Do I believe that, you know it would be uh, a good idea to invade Syria and, and would do like, less, ha less harm than good. I have absolutely no idea. Right? How could I possibly be in a position to know? Right? And one of the problems I think about our culture is the erosion of epistemic authority and the encouragement of a kind of you know, 
individualistic approach that says, you know, you, well, you decide for yourself. Now, there are good reasons why that's happened, and some of those have to do with the abuse of epistemic authority. And that's one of the things I want to mention at the end, that if we want to defend science against pseudoscience, we have to be really, really hard on the, on the abuses of science within science and on pseudoscience and science fraud and bad science within science. Because every story that comes out about one of those cases does more to play into the hands of the promulgators of pseudoscience and undermine scientific authority. And we need scientific authority for policy making and for our everyday lives. You know, when my son was a certain age, I took him to the medical center and they gave him, you know, they stuck something in his arm and they stuck a needle in his arm, right? Now, am I gonna take my little child and let any old person stick a needle in their arm? No, I do that because I believe in the authority of those clinicians and everything that backs up that authority. And, you know, without that and without us being in a position to trust that authority, our lives in our contemporary culture are not, are not going to be possible. We, just, we can't function. We rely upon the products of all of that. Science, I mean, that's, so there's, all of that was by way, I mean, something of a rant, but, but was by way of backing up Lakatos's point that the distinction between science and pseudoscience is of social and political relevance. So if people are producing pseudoscience in support of climate change skepticism, or in support of allowing homeopathy to be prescribed on the NHS, or in support of uh, undermining vaccination campaigns, you know, then that's of social and political importance. It's not just an idle uh, philosophical debate. Okay, so, the reason why I think that it's not sufficient just to confront pseudoscience with the evidence is because public debate and public discourse just doesn't have the time or the patience for that. And most people in the, that debate, the, 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 the people who are hearing about that debate, are simply unable to understand or engage in that activity. And as Chris was saying, the fact that we can't define pseudoscience doesn't, if that's true, doesn't mean that there isn't a genuine concept here that we need to be able to use and deploy. There are many things that we can't define, but we can have a sense of, 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 of paradigm cases. You know, pornography was the example given. There might be borderline cases where we, when we say we know it when we see it. I mean, that's not actually right, right? I mean, what we say is, we know when we see an extreme case, and we, I mean, a, a, a clear case, and we know when we see a clear case of not, and then there may be cases in the middle where we really have, you know, there's no fact of the matter, or we have no clear idea about which side of the line to put it on. Okay, so why is it illuminating to um, compare pseudoscience with bullshit? Well, I'll just cite uh, Frankfurt again here. And Frankfurt says, bullshit is a greater enemy of the truth than lies are. And he says that because he believes that lying doesn't undermine the whole project of forming you know, contentful beliefs about the world that are either true or false. But bullshitting does, right? It undermines the very project of having beliefs. I think that many of the people that I encounter who might claim to have, who say things about, for example, ensuring quality in higher education or something, actually, you're properly understood, don't really have any beliefs about the subject matter. And what they have is a certain repertoire of verbiage that they, that they, they, they come out with. Right now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then, uh, then listen to this. The important thing is to ensure that going forward, we put in place robust processes that deliver the services that people rightly expect to be of the highest quality. And that is why I've taken steps to ensure that our policies will be responsive to the needs on the ground. Right? <laughs> that 
I mean, I made that up, you know, in a moment. That could have come from any interview on the Today programme about anything, right? <laughs> That's the kind of thing we're getting more and more used to, right? They haven't said anything, apart from maybe some truisms, like people should have good things, not bad ones, and, you know... Systems should make things better, not worse. And, you know, they're not actually telling you any information. But there are people who specialise in speaking like that, and they can do it all day. Right? And what they, what they say has no contact whatsoever with whatever processes are actually going on that they're talking about, whether it's child protection or health or education or transport policy or whatever it is. Right? And that's why I think that this, you know, Frankfurt quote about bullshit being such a salient aspect of our culture is just, it's becoming more and more true. That you just hear it more and more. So, and, and, so, um, so I want to suggest, really, that, that pseudoscience can be, it can be importantly like that, right? It's not that the, the claims that are being made are making definite claims about, the, about how the facts are, and then we can find the evidence and show that they're false, is often that they're just not really saying anything at all. But to the uninitiated, they might sound like they are because of the appropriation of scientific-sounding words and jargon and so on. And one of the reasons why pseudoscience is, is so... we're so susceptible to it is because the average person listening to some scientific jargon has no way to distinguish it from pseudoscience. Right? Magnetic flux density is a genuine physical concept. Morphic resonance isn't. Right? But to the uninitiated, I mean, they, it's all sort of sounds, sounds akin, right? You know, lots of long Latinate words or whatever. So... Uh, now, I mean, they are, then, then, then they are, the thing about Frankfurt's concept of bullshit is that he then goes on to make this distinction, or at least I got this distinction from, from Jerry Cohen, actually, who, who, uh, who tried to further explore Frankfurt's idea of bullshit in a, in a book on the, t on the topic, between bullshit as product and bullshit as producer. Um, a bull bullshit, bullshit as what's produced by a bullshitter, right? So this is important if we think about science, that when we try to say, what's science, we could focus our attention on the product. And that's the kind of thing that goes on with Popper's idea of falsifiability. <coughs> right? You look at the what's been produced, and you ask the question, is that hypothesis falsifiable? And then Popper says, if it is, it's science. If it isn't, it's not. Right? On the other hand, you could just look at the producer, and you could say, no, it's science if you're open-minded and you want to seek refutation rather than confirmation or something like that. Right? And as with science, I think our conception of pseudoscience needs to involve both the product and the producer, and the relationship between them. And um, the, the, the problem with just focusing on the product is that if we, if we say something like, oh, the problem with pseudoscience is it's not falsifiable, it's very, very easy for pseudoscientists to correct that and make their claims falsifiable. So I don't know if you, I mean, yes, most of you, I'm usually talking to audiences and I say things like, you aren't young enough, you aren't old enough to remember. But you lot are, right? Uh, <laughs> you're, you're old enough to remember the millennial cult that all um, sadly killed themselves in, in California and they were going to go and jump on a comet, right? Now, um, you know, millennial cults, those kind of millennial cults, um, I mean, they had to do it because the world was going to end, right? That was why. And they needed to get on the spaceship that the comet really was in order to get away from, from the Earth because it, it was going to end. That was falsifiable. I mean, not sadly for the people who, who believed it and killed themselves, 
But as a hypothesis, it was falsifiable, right? The world didn't end, right? Millennial, I mean, um, there were all these stories about how all the computer systems were going to crash and so on. And the world, you know, people, people thought the world was going to end. Was it the Mayan calendar last year, wasn't it, right? It was falsifiable. I mean, the world didn't end. They said it was going to end. It didn't. Does that mean it was never pseudoscience? You know, can we, for any pseudoscientific hypothesis, we can always make it falsifiable by just adding on, oh, and it's a consequence that in the year 20, 2500, <coughs> such and such will happen. And now it makes an empirical prediction, so it's falsifiable, but that still doesn't make it scientific. Right, furthermore, unfortunately, there are lots of bits of science that aren't falsifiable. And at least, I mean, at least at the moment, so, they haven't found supersymmetry with the Large Hadron Collider. That means it must kick in at higher energies, right? So we need to build an even bigger particle accelerator to find evidence for it. So there, you know, it seems like the supersymmetry hypothesis is, is, is not particularly falsifiable, right? It's, mm, you know, when you discover that it wasn't found at that energy, you think, oh, it must be at a higher energy. You know, it sounds a little bit like an ad hoc modification of a theory, but more, um, more definitively, if you take the hypothesis like of the conservation of energy, it's not falsifiable in the for the following reason. If we found a putative violation of the conservation of energy, we would say we'd found a new source of energy. I mean, that's what happened when Pauli discovered the neutrino. It looked like there was missing energy, so he said, right, there must be a particle carrying away the energy, because we know conservation of energy is true. Something like conservation of energy is something like a regulative principle that sort of applies to science as a whole. It's very difficult to think of how you could falsify it as a hypothesis on its own. And that general, that's a general point. Scientific hypotheses are never falsifiable on their own. They're only falsifiable when you can join lots of them together and make a prediction, and then as many people have pointed out, what you then know if the prediction doesn't come true is only that the conjunction of all those hypotheses is false. It's then a different matter to say which one of them. As was illustrated by Chris when he was talking about Newton's theory of gravitation, where when they found that the orbit of uh, Uranus was wrong, they said, oh, must be another planet. They didn't say, and then that was because you couldn't just falsify Newton's theory of gravity on its own. You could only falsify Newton's theory of gravity conjoined with a hypothesis about how many planets there are and what their masses are and so on. And when you get falsification, you can choose to locate that problem with something other than the theory of gravity, namely with the hypothesis about how many planets there are. And what wasn't mentioned in much detail there was that they did, quite a few people did posit another planet to explain the anom anomalous orbit of Mercury. And they called it Vulcan. And I think that's where um, Vol the idea for Vulcan in Star Trek came from, I don't know. Um, but in advance, it's very, very difficult to say that those scientists were doing something unscientific. You know, they were following a perfectly reasonable strategy that had worked before. The theory of gravity had so much empirical support that it seemed reasonable to think that you'd made a, a, a mistake somewhere else rather than to regard that as false. So if we focus now on the producer, Popper liked to say that scientists are these incredibly open-minded, undogmatic people who are always desperately seeking to falsify their own theories, unlike bad psychoanalysts and Marxists who are always seeking to confirm them. But this just isn't true. I don't know if you've met any scientists, maybe some of you are scientists. Some of them are quite dogmatic, you know. Um, and you can hear that when they argue with each other. You know, they're, they're very, sometimes, in my area is philosophy of physics, you get people have very definite views about what's right. And they adhere to them for their whole lives. And their views about what's right and what good physics is and how it, should, how it should next be developed, kind of determine how they do their science. They're not the kinds of, th those kinds of views can be absolutely fundamental to what they think. And they're really not gonna say, oh, every time I do an experiment, I'm trying really hard to show that my most deeply cherished views about physics are false. They're just not. 
right? And that's not a bad thing, because in science, as in anything else in life, when you face difficult problems, you need to be tenacious. And tenacity often comes from a certain kind of self-belief and a certain fixity of opinion and you know, being sure that you're right, you know, being determined to... And, and this is even more true when you talk about the cases of scientists who've opposed an established theory and have faced a huge amount of opposition in, in, in getting it uh, accepted. Those people often have to be incredibly, have incredible resilience and self-belief in, in order to withstand, you know, the opprobrium of all their colleagues and, you know, looking like they're not going to get a job and whatever else. And they just, you know, they, they stick at it and eventually maybe they win out. So we can't, we can't say that what makes science science is that its hypotheses are falsifiable and everything else isn't. And we can't say that what makes science science is uh, that the individual scientists are these para paragons of, of reasonableness. Unfortunately, it's much more complicated. I think the best answer as to what makes science science is the way the scientific community is organised. Right? And what that means is that whilst you may have lots of individually quite dogmatic people. There are some people who are uncommitted and open-minded. They're often the people that come in and mediate between the, the two camps, the two opposing views about something. But you also have an institutional structure that encourages the people who disagree with each other to come together regularly and argue, right? The people who disagree with each other to seek to resolve their disputes through evidence, experiment, gathering... You know, gathering more data, reason, you know, all those things. So what makes pseudoscience pseudoscience then is, well, it's not that the hypotheses aren't necessarily falsifiable and it's not that the people aren't, uh, are, are dogmatic and that's bad. It's that the, system, the, the, the social organisation of the inquirers doesn't have the right characteristics. And that's, I mean, I think another very important feature that Chris brought out is that science on the whole is, forms an integrated, interconnected network, right? And it's the product of a vast social organisation. And pseudoscience often involves... A, a, a theory about some specific domain that makes no contact with the rest of what's going on. Oh, it, you know, people often argue about scientific reductionism and whether or not science is unified. Now, no, the, the full extent may be controversial, but in large measure, science is hugely unified. Right? The basic system of the periodic tables classification of the elements is just common to all of science. The common system of scientific units and measurement is common to all of science. And so, so there's another characteristic, I think, of, of science that pseudoscience is, is missing. OK, so why is, um, is pseudoscience attractive? Well. I've already mentioned uh, the fact that we have to place our epistemic trust in, in, in science. And pseudoscience can be given support by abuses of that trust from within mainstream science. And people can be susceptible to a kind of um, glamour of the heterodox, right? You know, you start, people from the outside who think, well, all those scientists, they're all, just agreeing, they're all just agreeing with each other in order to put forward what they've decided is the truth. And the pseudoscientists are like the iconoclastic you know, rebels you know, standing up against that. So when we see the scientific establishment in cahoots with ideology, uh, abusing the trust that we have in it, then that lends credence to the idea that, well, it's not so great after all. And sadly, there are some really egregious examples of that happening. So we don't have to go that far back. If we go back to 
the early 20th century then, and the late 19th century, then we can find psychiatrists um, effectively you know, or ordering the imprisonment of women for what we'd now call a healthy interest in sex, regarding that as a disorder. If we go back to the 1960s, we can find the American Psychiatric Association regarding homosexuality as a mental illness. Uh, there's a famous case of, uh, drug of a drug trial um, involving deliberately infecting a very large number of African Americans with syphilis, like literally giving people syphilis in order to see what happened to them. And uh, we get the kind of, you know, on a more prosaic level, much less pernicious, but still epistemically very bad, we get the promulgation of just-so just stories from evolutionary psychology and a kind of spurious theorizing with very little uh, support. We have uh, continuing problems with psychiatric classification, which often seems to be very much driven by what drugs you can give, you know, the identification of disorders associated with a drug that a, a, a company is heavily marketing. And there's a lot of pressure for the psychiatrist to have a, gen a syndrome there so that the drug can be sold. I mean, lots of people say that um, there's very little evidence for the vast majority of cases of mild depression, very, very little evidence for any efficacy whatsoever to um, selective serotonin uptake inhibitors, what we, you know, Prozac, right? But the number of, of, of uh, young people, you know, I work in a university, lots of um, students have little crises, you know, what, we would, what would previously have been regarded as um, just stuff you have to deal with in life is now medicalized and they're given drugs for it. It's not obvious that that's serving anybody's interests other than the interests of the drug companies. And um, there's a movement in America to invent a syndrome called sex addiction. And that's got two purposes. One is it allows uh, male philanderers to get off the hook uh, because they say they're a sex addict and they need treatment, you know. Uh, I need, sorry, you know, didn't do anything wrong, I just need help. Um, but it also uh, is involving the the prescription of quite powerful drugs uh, to young girls uh, because their attitudes and interests and activities do not fit with a very puritanical approach to sex in certain um, subcultures. And so, in fact, if you, if, you, if you look into it, you know, go on Google, you find a vast, vast amount of supposed science about sex addiction. Uh, and one of my best friends is a, is a world expert on addiction, and he's convinced there is absolutely no such thing. It does not make any sense whatsoever uh, as, as a genuine uh, addictive disorder. So uh, those are just a few examples. I, I mean, I, I'm, I make those examples because I don't, like I said, I don't, you know, I think we need to be really, if we want to um, criticize pseudoscience, then we have to be critical and you know, we, we, we mustn't you know, say science good, everything else bad. And I think there are many, many pressures within, uh, within science now that are going to exacerbate the, the tendency for it to produce pseudoscience and science fraud and bad science. And that's the need for people to um, produce results with impact. Uh, there's, there's lots of stories at the moment about researchers who, get, who, who work for the government who are under pressure to change their results and cases of researchers being phoned up by civil servants and being asked to remove bits of data from reports that they're doing. And within universities now, we're all under pressure to show that we are you know, holding hands with non-academic users. And uh, what that often means, I mean, luckily for me, holding hands with non-academic users means coming here, you know, talking to the public or something, going into schools, doing a bit of philosophy. But for many people, that means is working with governments or corporations. And that undermines scientific objectivity and impartiality and neutrality. And, um, and it also, um, I think, threatens what makes science science. So science is unique in being self-correcting. Self 
In, in, until the 1990s, all cosmologists thought that the universe was, ex, was accelerating in its, uh, well, sorry, was slowing down in its rate of expansion. And then in the 1990s, they said, oh, no, we've got new data. We're all wrong. We got it wrong. We just got it completely wrong. It's not. It's actually accelerating in its rate of expansion. There are many, many examples where scientists have corrected their own theories. There's just no other form of social organization that does that. Right? So if you think of something superficially like science, then think of the industry associated with high finance. Right? There are lots of very clever people employed to like, write very long reports involving lots and lots of data using very, very big computers. Right? They have no tendency whatsoever to be self-correcting. After the crash, they may then all immediately start writing reports about why it happened, but prior to it, then no one was advertising the errors in the stories they were promulgating about the economy, though lots of them s seemingly knew what was going to happen because they were shifting their own private assets uh, into other classes. Um, you know, if we mess about too much with science, I mean, if I'm right in saying that science is about, is a, is a so, what makes science science is a social organization and how that social organization functions. Now, one of the things about science is it's just about the only social organization where you get praised for, for pointing out one of your own mistakes. If we make science into something where more and more individual scientists have to jump up and say how great they are and tell everyone what they've just discovered and jump into bed with corporations and governments and so on, then we could, we could tip, tip it into a new equilibrium where it starts to not be self-correcting and then we're all in, in very great trouble because pretty much everything about our lives that's, that's good uh, it, it depends upon... Uh, the advancement of science t to this point, and I, I, don't, I don't want it to stop. Okay, uh, I was hoping to leave lots of time for questions, but I don't think I got into it and rambled on, so I'll stop now. Thanks a lot. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, we've got five or ten minutes. Uh... So, put your hand up if you would like to ask James a question. Yes. Um, in, a, in a practical sense, what, what do you think um, we should be doing uh, with regard to pseudoscience, uh, given the fact that you've explained how it can have a very negative social impact and political impact? What kind of things do we need to do one negative thing we could do would be we could not misrepresent the nature of, of science. So uh, one of the things I, I didn't mention is kind of scientific hubris, right? So I think we should, we should be really careful about overstating uh, cer uh, no, our, our degree of certainty and, and how much we know we based on what the science that we have. On the positive side, um, make it illegal to teach creationism in schools? Um, I don't know. I mean, I kind of think... Look, look, we just have to face up to the fact that, that there is ep epistemic authority and we have to have it. So, therefore, we shouldn't have some kind of idea that we are going to teach the debate every time... You know, I don't think in school we should teach the debate such as there, I mean, you know, there is, in some quarters, a debate about whether the Holocaust happened, right? We shouldn't teach that. You know, we have to decide, and it's a, it's a tough decision to make, but we have to decide, you know, we're gonna, what we're going to teach our children, and we're going to tell them, this is, this is what you should believe. This is the truth, right? Now, we have to do that knowing that some of what we're telling them might be wrong in the details, and it's not all going to be 100% and so on, but we have to tell them something... And we have to make that decision and we have to stand by it. So I would say we teach them that there is anthropogenic global warming. There is, like, the Holocaust did happen, right? The um, homeopathy doesn't work, right? Um, but we can explain why people think it does. Um, 
And, and what we had is last, lack of political leadership. Uh, and, and I think in large part that, la I mean, so we saw it with, with the previous government, uh, with encouraging um, faith schools and so on. But we've also seen it with this government, with uh, many of the free schools are actually run by big corporations and, and, and some of those are bankrolled by people who have no real interest in, in the you know, scientific kind of humanist worldview. So, um, I mean, I, I kind of admire the French somewhat in this, in this regard, that they are, they, you know, they're resolutely uh, secularist and humanist and scientific about their education system. Um, so I guess I, I would definitely be in favour of that. I mean, if my, if, my, if my son came back from school telling me that he'd learned at, at school that on the one hand, you know, some people say there was this, you know, six million people thereabouts, you know, killed by the Nazis, but others say, others say it's been hugely exaggerated. I'd be furious, right? Uh, and so equivalently, I, you know, if he came home and told me um, well, some people think you should have your children vaccinated, but other people think not. And we were told to write an essay weighing up the two sides or something. I think, no. I mean, you know, on the one hand, I think we should teach more the nature of science and so on. Um, and I've, I mean, I'm a professional philosopher, so I think everyone should be taught to be critical and to debate and use reason and so on. But on the other hand, there's been a tendency in science education to not teach them core theories, but just to teach them you know, debates about, so children, instead of learning what, you know, the basic atomic theory of matter is, they're writing essays for and against nuclear power, right? This is a complete waste of time, right? They're not remotely in a position to evaluate the arguments for and against nuclear power. They're, you know, there's no fact-free thought. So whilst we want our children to think, we need to fill them up with facts to think about to develop their ability to think. And the best source of those facts is, is scientific orthodoxy. Um, yeah. Thank you very much.